Hi everyone, I'm Charlene Habermeyer and welcome to Good Parenting Brighter Children Facebook Live. Uh, I know the Saturday evenings are crazy busy and uh, so those of you who have not been able to tune in live, uh, we are recording this and I will be posting it on all three of my Facebook pages as well as my YouTube channel. I'm very excited about my guest speaker tonight. Uh, it's my son, Ryan Habermeyer, and he hails all the way from Maryland. Let me tell you a little bit about Ryan and what he's going to be talking about. Ryan was born and raised in California, and he received his master's degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in creative writing. He went on to the University of Missouri at Columbia and received his PhD in English. Uh, he is currently a professor at Salisbury University in Maryland, and where he teaches a number of different subjects, including uh, fairy tales. Uh, Ryan has, uh, is considered a, um, an expert and a scholar on European folk tales and fairy tales. He has lectured across the United States and in Europe. He has lectured at Harvard University and at King's College in England, and all about the importance of fairy tales and all different aspects of fairy tales. Um, he is married to Jenna, and he and his uh, ch four children, as I mentioned before, live in Maryland. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of credit here. Uh, I love fairy tales, and I wanted my sons to love fairy tales. So I began reading to them in utero, and I took books with me to the hospital and began reading to them within a couple of hours after birth. And then I read to them every day since that time uh, until they left and went on to college. One of my very favorite genres of books are fairy tales. I love the magic of fairy tales. I love the just everything about fairy tales. And so you can imagine how thrilled I was when I'm, one of our sons became very interested in fairy tales. And Ryan has done a lot more in-depth studying on fairy tales than I ever did. And so I'm excited to have him here so that he can answer your questions. And one other thing, he was recently published. He's actually been um, has been published in numbers of journals uh, that have been published throughout the United States. And then recently, this is his first book that just recently came out. It's called The Science of Lost Futures. And when his publisher was reading the stories, they said, these sound like wonderful modern day fairy tales. So let's bring Ryan up. And Ryan, thank you for being here. Thank you for agreeing to um, be interviewed. There was a few, a few weeks ago, I actually posted a blog about fairy tales and I wanted Ryan to be on Facebook Live, but he was inundated at, at, with all of his classes. And so this is our first opportunity. So thank you, Ryan, for being here. And let's just jump right in. So right. Ryan, tell us what are fairy tales? Um, you know, we talk about myths and legends and folk tales, but what constitutes a fairy tale? So there are like some small kind of distinctions that uh, academics like myself make with respect to fairy tales. Um, I'll start with myths. So like one of the things that we talk about with myths um, is that myths are like the sacred truths of a particular community, uh, the sort of spiritual truths of whatever community. So an academic like myself might refer to like the myth of Christianity or the myths of Islam. And that's not like in a very dismissive sense. We're actually talking about what are those sacred stories that particular communities of the Christian faith and the Islamic faith tell. So myths are distinct in that kind of nebulous area, some historic areas as well. So like the perfect example of a legend would be King Arthur, right? So there are certain historical artifacts that we have that prove that there was a guy named Arthur who was a king at some time early in Britain's history. But all the stories that have been told about Arthur and the round table and all the legends of King Arthur, those are potentially embellished stories that were handed down from one generation to the next before they were transcribed. Folk tales or fairy tales, in contrast to myth, are more of the secular stories of a particular community. So these are stories told by the folk, and the folk could run from 
very rich people to very poor people and everyone in between as well, but they are stories told for entertainment. So the term that a lot of folklorists like myself use to describe fairy tales is the German word Mürken, which just means a wonder tale. And it's one of the things that we often talk about and remember when we think about fairy tales is that there's a level of magic or there's enchantment that's involved where the real world is transformed into in some sort of supernatural way. So those are the kinds of distinctive terminologies that we use. I mean, um, to the average person, they probably don't make much difference whatsoever, but it's kind of an interesting classification thing that we do um, for scholars. Okay, so we're just a lay person here. So on a fairy tale, to me, a fairy tale is something that's a little bit more magical. You know, you always have a hero and a heroine. And, right. and so to me, that's more of a fairy tale. But where were the origins? How did, where did fairy tales begin? Uh, you know, there, was there a specific country? Did it start with the Grimm's brothers or was it even before that? Well, I, I think we like to have the idea. I think everyone's probably heard the Grimm's brothers before. And so we think that they go back, you know, the brothers Grimm were correct, uh, collecting tales in the early 1800s. But we've been telling stories for thousands and thousands of years, you know, and like I was just saying between these differences between myth, legend and folklore, you know, there's a lot of overlap between them. You know, mythic stories have a lot of fairy tale elements in them and fairy tales have a lot. They draw a lot of mythic elements. And so there's kind of this wonderful cross pollination, I would use the term uh, that exists between all of the tales. But, you know, we've been telling tales for as long as human beings have been human beings beans and so it's pretty much next to impossible to lay like a single point of origin it's one thing i always have to tell my students that there are no original tales there are only multiple variations of every tale so each tale that has existed there's multiple variants uh, that's what that's the term that we use them in academia to describe them and these are just the different versions of the tales and so like for example with cinderella you know when we talk about the origins of a particular fairy tale, what we're talking about mostly is like, what is the earliest recorded example that we might have? And because uh, archeologists, anthropologists are always discovering new things and discovering new tales, our sense and understanding of what is the oldest recorded version we have is always shifting, right? There's always this kind of fluid ground for them. So for Cinderella, for example, um, there are over 900, maybe like a thousand different versions of that particular story. And as of my last recollection, I think the oldest recorded version we have is actually a Chinese version of that tale. So it's kind of a misnomer to say like, where did they begin? Because I think fairy tales have always been with us. They've always been part of our community that, um, that we've been formed, that we've formed as human beings. And it's just part of the human experience, which I think is something that makes them so wonderful. Okay, this particular picture that you see of Cinderella, that was the one that when I was just probably five years old, I went to the library with my sister, and my sister told the librarian she loves fairy tales, so she pointed out where the fairy tales were, and I remember taking this book off the shelf, opening that first page, and there she was in all of her splendor and glory. So tell me, Ryan, why do you think it's important for parents to... Um, to read fairy tales to their kids? That's an interesting and complicated question. Um, you know, one of the things about fairy tales in talking, you know, like what I was just saying about how they've always been with us, I think fairy tales perhaps more than any other kind of story that we tell, right? And there's lots of different kinds of stories that we tell within our communities and um, within our various cultures. Um, fairy tales re like reflect this sense of our dreams, our anxieties, our fears, our fantasies, the things that we would that we would like to happen, the, the, the changes that we want to see within our particular communities. And so I think that's one aspect for kids is they allow children to tell stories that allow them to bond and form these kinds of communal relationships, that there's this sense that children through storytelling are are allowed to build a sense of of community and you know fairy tales have always been told you know before they were written down um fairy tales were always an oral storytelling tradition and they get passed on from one generation to the next one storyteller to the next and this is the reason why we have so many different versions of fairy tales is because the stories change as they pass from one one storyteller to the next you know um perhaps 
uh, you know, way back in the historical record, you know, at one particular moment in time, a certain version of Cinderella needed to be told, but then a hundred years later, that version had fallen out of favor amongst uh, the various storytellers because things changed within the community, things changed within the culture. And so storytell uh, fairy tales morph, they change, they transform. And, and for children especially, one of the real great values of fairy tales, and it's a wonderful quote, I absolutely love it, it comes from G.K. Chesterton. He says, and I'm gonna butcher the quote because I don't have it specifically memorized, but he says, you know, fairy tales are not about telling children that dragons exist. Um, he sort of jokingly says, children already know that dragons exist. He says, the value of fairy tales for children is to learn that dragons can be conquered, that dragons can be defeated. And so when we tell these stories, these fairy tales that, that contain all our anxieties and all of our fears, fairy tales are like this very safe medium through which we can conquer our fears, that we can learn to overcome, um, that we can see who we are and who we want to be. And they're kind of the stories that we tell about ourselves. And so I think for children, especially one of, you know, one of the reasons why children gravitate to fairy tales is obviously the magic. I mean, for me as an adult now, that's still part of the nostalgia of going back to fairy tales is I just love the sense of enchantment, that idea of like once upon a time. But for kids, it's a really empowering thing to know that here you have these children, because so often fairy tales deal with children in horrendous situations. They can socially, symbolically act out. It's like the staging of, um, of conquering your fears and your anxieties and being able to imagine a better world. Okay, and that kind of brings me um, to what, you know, and I've read Bruno Bettelheim's The Uses of Enchantment, and I'll just paraphrase basically what he said, not only what you're saying, but he, he said, you know, the parents basically say to the child, you know, this is a wonderful world, you can accomplish anything you want in this world, but the fairy tale doesn't say that. Like mm -hmm. you said, the fairy tale, you know, they're... The, the hero they're horrendous the they're dead. terrible <laughs> yeah there's, there's terrible things that happen to them. i mean take cinderella and snow white both of their parents die and they're left to you know with terrible situations with stepmothers right. and so um he says the fairy tale says to the child it is a cold cruel world out there and it's waiting to eat you alive but then it says as you said if you have courage and if you persist you can overcome any obstacle, you can conquer your foes, you can reach your heart's desires. There's all those good aspects of a fairy tale. So I know that some of the, t the beginnings of fairy tales, when you mentioned that they were an oral tradition, some of them were more violent. So where does Disney come in? Uh, you and I were talking about this because a lot of the fairy tales, that, you know, there's when you talk about, there's been about uh, over a thousand versions of Cinderella. Well, some of the versions that I've read are pretty violent. So what part did Disney play in all this? Yeah, so one of the one of my personal heroes of fairy tales is a scholar named Jack Zipes, um, who's written extensively about fairy tales since the 1970s. And I think he uses a, a wonderful phrase to describe Disney. He talks about Disney having cast a magic spell over the fairy tale world. So, you know, as I was talking before about sort of the trajectory and progression of, of fairy tales, you know, the, the oldest tales that we have, and forgive me, I'm gonna do a little historical chronology here. So some of the oldest written tales that we have come from Italy, actually, um, and they were written down in the 16th century. And then from there, the tales are next written down in 17th century France. And the Grimm brothers actually come along uh, a little bit late in this history of recording and writing down tales, although they're the most famous ones. And the Grimm brothers helped solidify our idea of what a fairy tale is simply because of the mass marketing of publishing that was available in the early 1800s. And so after the Grimm brothers, um, Victorian England, one of the things that uh, a lot of folklorists in Victorian England did was they were collecting tales from all over the world. And Disney is, you know, the Grimm brothers, they were purging a lot of the, um, not the violent content, they were actually purging a lot of the sex, sexual content of the tales out of them because, you know, a lot of fairy tales uh, are very body, they're very racy, they're very, you know, they're not the kind of things you probably want to read to your kids per se. Um, and But the Grimm brothers kept the violence um, because they thought that that was necessary, you know, that good sort of German discipline, I guess you might say. Um, 
And so Disney comes along and what Disney does is he is trying to, there, there's a conscious effort on his part to, to whitewash the tales and the effect, and Jack Zipes talks about this in his book, the effect of what Disney did because it was film, it made it seem like there's only this one version of the tale, right? So, I mean, most of us, especially in America, when we think of fairy tales, our minds go almost directly to uh, Disney versions. And so we think that like the only version of Cinderella is the one that we remember from that 1950s film. But, you know, as I was saying before, there's multiple, multiple variants. So yeah, like in one version of the Grimm story of, of Cinderella, right? Her stepsisters uh, are trying to get their feet into the slipper because they want to marry the prince. And so one of the things they do is they actually chop off their heels and they're all bleeding and it's all over the place, right? And they're trying to stuff these bloody stumps into the into the slipper um, and as a punishment for their misdeeds for trying to lie and misbehave these birds come down and peck out their eyes and the sisters have to go wandering the landscape so that's just an example of how a story changes from one culture to the next you know disney was saying look i'm i'm writing from an american perspective not a german a german perspective but because the films were visual rather than orally told we get this sense when we watch the movies that this is the one true version of the tale. You know, I talk about it with my students, usually on the first day of class. I always ask them, you know, like, what's what's the version of Cinderella that you know? Or what's the version of, like, Sleeping Beauty or Snow White? And nine times out of ten, they'll rehearse this, uh, the, ver the Disney version of it. And they're always startled and amazed to just see that there are these multiple variants, these multiple ways that the story can go. And that's like I was saying before, it's because it changes from one storyteller to the next. I mean, we're now 50, 60 years removed from Disney and fairy tales continue to change. They continue to transform. There are different writers who are, you know, there's a rich contemporary history of fairy tales of writers rewriting, reimagining, rethinking, whether that's on television or that's in films or those in, in, in fiction and in literature and poetry, fairy tales are constantly in flux. You know, that's one of the magical things about the fairy tale form as an art form is that it's constantly moving just like the magic within the story themselves. Okay, one of the things I remember, okay, so basically Disney, excuse me, kind of introduced the concept that every fairy tale ends with happily ever after. Yes. <coughs> excuse me. Which is not always the case in actual fairy tales. I mean, a lot of fairy tales, and gruesomely, I mean, just to give you an example, Snow White. Um, in the in the grim version of Snow White, the wicked queen, the, the stepmother queen, her punishment is that she has to dance in red hot shoes until she dies, which is one of my favorite endings of all fairy tales because it's just so outlandish and so bizarre and so strange as in who would wear red hot iron shoes and dance until they die. It's just wonderfully odd and out of the normal. Well, one of the big things I remember, um, there were articles in Los Angeles Times and by the time they were articles about fairy tales, you know, this was already talked about in academic circles in the 70s, but one of the criticisms that certainly a number of women feminists were um, that didn't like about fairy tales was the fact that women were portrayed that number one they did a lot of domestic chores and number two they were always saved by quote unquote man but what is your feeling about this because i had to tell you as a child what i didn't see that in fairy tales what i saw in fairy tales is that if you were really good and you did everything right, that even though you came from difficult circumstances, that eventually good things would happen to you. So what's your take on it? Well, I think there's a lot of validity to some of the critiques um, of what Disney did. And you know, even before, I mean, what's interesting to me is that in the early recording of fairy tales, like the, the what we call as scholars, the literary fairy tales. So, we distinguish between oral tales that were told for centuries and centuries and that were passed along word of mouth and between the literary versions, so the written down versions of tales. And at the inception, um, uh, you know, one of the earliest recorded versions of fairy tales was actually done by women in France in the 17th century. Uh, there was a whole range of women uh, very powerful, wealthy, aristocratic women who wrote tales and they were sick and tired of the oral tales that were told by male storytellers. And so they wanted to reimagine these kinds of early feminist versions of tales in which fairies were these very 
powerful figures within the tale. I mean, Fran France is actually where we get our term fairy tale. You know, the, the term conte du fait comes from French, and the, we translated that into uh, the story of fairies. So, I mean, there's a lot of validity to, you know, in the 70s and 80s, as you were talking about, several, you know, very famous writers, Anne Sexton, amazing poet, wrote a book called Transformations, a uh, book of poetry in which she sort of poked fun at and ridiculed the idea of a, th this male-dominated world of fairy tales where women are sort of relegated to chores and tasks and such. And then uh, in the late 70s, a wonderful author named Angela Carter, who wrote a book called The Bloody Chamber, um, all about fairy tales. And again, this is like what I was saying before, you know, the, the fairy tale is always in flux. It's always going to change. Um, and so it's it's moved now in our contemporary moment away from the sort of male dominated world per se um, to a much more feminist interpretation of them, which I think is, you know, who knows what it's going to be in 25, 35 years from now. But, you know, what you're talking about with the way that you read them is obviously based upon your own circumstances and your own context and your own personal biography, right? And all of that is influential in shaping how we each receive and understand the tales. So, I mean, I sympathize with those interpretations. I understand those kinds of interpretations, but, you know, the fairy tale is going to keep changing and transforming um, from one generation to the next. It's never going to stay static. And I think to come back to your earlier question, that's kind of the danger of the Disney tales is it makes us think there's only one true way to tell this story. And, you know, I see that happening with my kids, to be honest. Like when I, when I, when my kids were a lot younger and I'd tell them a story, they wanted me to tell it exactly the same way twice. You know, kids love repetition over and over and over again. And, you know, I'd always tweak details. I'd change details. You know, maybe I'd cut out something because it's a little too violent and I didn't want to tell them that, or I'd change a little detail here and there. So, I mean, there's always going to be a sense of change and transformation that I think is vital to the fairy tale form. Well, and you know what? You see that change actually with Disney. Women are becoming more powerful in the fairy tale, like Brave. You know, she was fiery red hair and very, right. very brave. And then you have Rapunzel. And so a lot of them, I think that they're portraying women as strong and capable and, you know, everything that yeah. you see in the 21st century. Yeah, so, look at look at our current cultural moment, right? It's, ve it's very different right now. And that's why you see you know, the ones you mentioned. And I, I mean, I, I'd throw in there too Frozen, right? I mean, Frozen's a very different kind of fairy tale that Disney, um, you know, 30 years ago, Frozen would have been a very different story. You know, now they're, they're you know, the writers at Disney are responding to the current cultural moment. And so you're going to keep seeing them change. And I understand that desire and urge to keep the fairy tale static. Like we love that idea of repetition. We love that idea of tradition, but you have to understand that historically speaking, the tales have always changed and they always change when they move from one culture to the next, you know, and it's kind of weird because fairy tales don't move, right? I mean, they're not like an actual thing, but the people do people exchange culture, people exchange ideas. And so that's how these stories got from one version to another. You know, there's a very French version of Little Red Riding Hood. There's a very German version of Little Red Riding Hood. There's a very American version of Red Riding Hood that Disney did. And it's always going to change. Okay. Um, Amy Lynn said that she, I love reading the grim versions to my grade one classes. Of all the versions, I know Charles Perrault was the French version and you're talking Italian versions. Aren't the grim versions probably the most benign, violent. I mean, less violent and all? Oh, they do have violence in them, but. The, the grim ones, yeah, the grim ones are definitely the most, the most violent ones that you can find. Like if you go and you find the actual, um, you know, the interesting thing about Grimm is, so like the first version of Grimm was published in 1812 and it did very, very poorly when it sold. And that's because the Grimm brothers were scholars, you know, they, they weren't storytellers. They were just going out collecting these versions from different people. And so um, it was very scholarly. Like it had, I think like a hundred pages of footnotes uh, to show like all their annotations and all the scholarly work that they were doing. Um, there were subsequently like, I can't remember, nine or 10 different versions between 1812 and like 1857, I think was the, when the last version was published. And they constantly went under this editorial revision, one edition after the next. And as things moved on, they sort of changed their audience from adults. It was written much more towards an adult scholarly audience, and then it moved more towards children. 
but the Grimm's versions are absolutely the most the most violent of them. Um, I would say that like the earlier versions, the the Italian versions are probably the most uh, most comic, the most body, the most raunchy uh, versions of of fairy tales. Uh, the French versions are very proper, very elite, very uh, civilized, prim and proper, which kind of speaks to French people. Sorry if there's anyone French listening right now, but that's just the very aspect of the the French fairy tale versions. Um, and yeah, the German versions are very brutal. It's, it's a harsh, brutal world out there. Okay, now Amy asked again, don't the archetypes stay the same though? Some of them do, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, the idea of like archetypal figures, like like Cinderella, for example. And, and that's something with, you know, like Cinderella, right? So one of the things that folklorists do is we've cataloged and classified different what we call tale types which are tales that seem to have similar ideas or similar um what we call motifs like similar narrative threads and those are like like amy's saying here these are kind of like the archetypes um the sort of standard narrative form so i mean you could look at it with um like little red riding Hood's a great example of like the kind of archetypes that maintain from one version to the next you know, in all versions of Little Red Riding Hood, you essentially have a young girl who is, you know, her mother says you got to go to grandma's house and you got to cut through the woods to get there. You know, the woods, you know, to us now, we kind of, the woods are tamed. Nature is sort of tamed and we, we, we were able to control it. But 200, 300 years ago, the woods were a dangerous place. You know, the woods were, were, were very dangerous. Animals, you could meet strangers, bad things can happen. So she's got to cut through the belly of these woods to get to grandma's house. And, and then there's the wolf, right? So like those things are still the same, but, but then you always have small little differences. And this is something that as folklorists and fairy tale scholars, we look for. So in, I'll go backwards here so you can see the difference. In the grim version of Little Red Riding Hood, same thing, little girl goes to the woods, get to grandma's house. Um, she's eaten by the wolf when she gets there. What happens then is the huntsman comes along in the grim version, here's the, wolf, here's the wolf snoring, cuts open the wolf, frees little red and grandma, and then kills the wolf and everyone goes along their way. If you look at about 150 years before that though, Charles Perrault's version from France, same things, but we have a slight change in the story because the wolf eats little red and that's the end of the story. There's no huntsman, there's no saving. And at the end of the Peral version, he says, his moral is to caution little girls about beware of the company you keep because no one's gonna save you. Earlier than that, one of the earliest recorded versions of Little Red Riding Hood that we have, one of the things that happens is same thing. Red Riding Hood goes, gets eaten by the wolf. Okay, or sorry, no, actually she doesn't get eaten by the wolf. She goes into the forest. The wolf tries to get her to eat her. Um, and she has to trick the wolf. She fools the wolf. She says, you know what, wolf, I'm not going to get into bed so you can eat me. Can I go use the bathroom? And she runs out through the window and she escapes the wolf. So you see these, yeah, the archetypes remain mostly the same, but there are these small little differences that change from one culture to the next. Interesting. So let me ask you this. If you were starting to read a fairy tale, let's say to one of your children, where would you start? The classic ones like Little Red Riding Hood, Cinderella, Snow White. I know that you mentioned that you really like um, Beauty and the Beast. Um, where mm -hmm. would you start? I think the classic ones are a great place to start, right? There are those those classic tales and, you know, Disney has done a pretty good job of uh, doing versions of all them. I mean, I think all the ones that you mentioned, I think it's really helpful too to read cross-cultural versions of fairy tales. You know, so um, you can find these and, you know, there's a lot of um, publications now where you can get uh, copies of fairy tales based upon the region in which they're produced. So like they're organized by Little Red Riding Hood and then there's like 10 or 15 different versions of the Little Red Riding Hood story. So you can do those kinds of comparisons to see, oh, you know, well, what's the Little Red Riding Hood version in France as opposed to what it's like in uh, the Middle East? And you got like Sleeping Beauty and you have all these standardized kinds of tales. So it's nice to have um, the classic versions, but then you can move to less common, less understood, less known versions of tales. Okay, and Catherine is asking, what do you feel is the best version to read to children? I'll just put in my two cents worth. I think uh, Grimm's and Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Until they get older. I mean, if you want to use them as 
you know, as critical thinking, then you can bring in the Peralt and the Italian versions. But personally, I don't know how you feel, Ryan, but I would start with the Grimm's. That's what I started with you kids. Yeah, I mean, I started my kids with Grimm. You know, that that's where I think I first, uh, if I remember correctly, that I was reading them Grimm. Um, I think I think it depends also like on how old your kids are. Some kids are older and more mature, and so they're you know they can handle and, and think about it. And, and it's also a parenting to choice. You know, I'm not going to tell parents what exactly how much you know stuff going on you want to expose your your children to. But I mean, you can't go wrong starting with with uh, with the Grimm brothers. Um, the French fairy tales, the Charles Perrault versions are very archetypal. They're the, they're stories that we recognize. Um, just like the Grimm, but you know the the female French writers I was talking before, they have very unknown, less common ones that may be a little bit more difficult for children. Um, I definitely wouldn't recommend the Italian versions for kids. Those are uh, those are for adults only. <laughs> I guess I would say so. X rated. Okay, let's well, talk not about X rated, but they're 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 pretty saucy. Yes, they are. So let's talk about Harry Potter. All right, a couple of things about Harry Potter. First of all, is it a fairy tale? And second of all, um, there are parents who are concerned about having their kids watch Harry Potter. So let's, first of all, is it a fairy tale? Well, it depends on who you ask, right? Um, and even, I think there's a lot of divide amongst folklorists and fairy tale scholars as to how much Harry Potter is a fairy tale. There's certainly, so I mean, you could take the really strict approach and you could say, no, it's definitely not a fairy tale because there's no antecedent for it. There's no like oral history of the story of a boy who becomes a magician, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not like in the rigid sense a fairy tale, but it definitely has folk and fairy tale elements. It definitely includes a lot of very common things that we see in fairy tales, like a hero or a heroine faced against almost impossible odds. Um, we have magical helpers, which is a very common thread in fairy tales. Often in fairy tales, those magical helpers are animals. Um, so, you know, something like Dobby in the fairy tales, is, uh, sorry, Dobby in the Harry Potter stories is a very magical helper, but also Harry's friends, right? I mean, he's not alone in the world which is very much a, a, a through line of all fairy tales is that heroes or heroines rarely accomplish feats on their own. They're usually always assisted by someone or something somewhere. Um, so, you know, in a very rigid sense, like if you want to be really strict about your definitions, you can say, no, Harry Potter's not one, but I think Harry Potter is a kind of modernized version of a fairy tale. You know, JK Rowling to me clearly knows her fairy tales. Um, but she does a kind of hodgepodge. She pulls in from fairy tales. She pulls in mythic elements too. Um, she pulls in legendary elements. She creates new legends. So she's created this wonderful magical world of stories that has a lot of familiar echoes that we often see from fairy tales. So again, like it depends on how you want to define it. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day whether it's a fairy tale or not. Um, it's really great storytelling. It is, and uh, when you're talking about, she pulls in different things like the invisibility cloak that Harry gets for Christmas. That comes from a fairy tale, right? Um, there are fairy tales with invisibility cloaks. There are myths, uh, Scandinavian myths with uh, um, invisibility cloaks and invisibility hats as well. Um, but yeah, things like that. So yeah, she's she's drawing from all over the place. Basically what she says is the mythic world and the fairy tale world is a hodgepodge and I can pull and create my own things uh, whatever I want to create. And, and, you know, she's making her own legendary realities in the context of the story as well. So, you know, it's sort of a hodgepodge of myth, legend, folklore, and fairy tale. But you know what? I love the story. I love the fact that Harry has his friends who support and help him. He's the hero of the story. And I think something that's really interesting um, that people who don't want their kids to be exposed to Harry Potter you know, at the end, I mean, here he has Voldemort, who's killed both of his parents. He's an evil guy, and uh, he throws that death curse on Harry, and Harry does come back to life. But as you and I talked about, Harry never throws the death curse on Voldemort, which to me shows a very compassionate turn the other cheek. Now, the German coming out of me would say, Harry, kill him once and for all. Get rid of him. He's a bad guy. He, you know, killed your parents. Just dump him. 
but I like the twist at the end of how uh, Rawlings has him show this very turn the other cheek type of thing. I mean, Baltimore, go ahead. So what, you, what is no, your No, yeah, I mean, Harry's very noble all the way through, right? I mean, that that's sort of from start to finish. Um, he sort of refuses to engage in that kind of, um, not that he doesn't, well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess what I want to say, you know, one of the interesting things about the Harry Potter stories to me, and, you know, we were talking a little bit about this before, and I've actually talked with friends about this who, friends that I know that have misgivings one way or another because they think it's evil or, you know, whatever. I just know people that have these feelings that they don't want to read Harry Potter. You know, Harry Potter presents a rather complex moral world. Um, it's, it's a very challenging, you know, it, it's not a world of black and whites. It's not a world of clearly, you know, we do have Harry and Voldemort on one side or the other, but, you know, there's a great scene and, it, and they, they put it into the movies too, and I'm probably going to butcher the quote of it, but, you know, when Harry's having that conversation with, with Sirius and Sirius says, you know, we all have the light and dark within us. The world isn't divided into Death Eaters and Auras. You know, there's this sense of there's Harry, like, like many characters in fairy tales, is coming of age. And he's got to learn that what to what to do, what what's right in each particular situation, each particular scenario. So it's a really gray moral world, which I think is the reason why some people were upset with that story. Um, people of more religious fundamentalism, you know, that, that they wanted the stark black and white. Um, and you know, the fairy tale world. I think a lot of people say that the fairy tale world is easy black and white, but. You go and read the stories, and, and, and it's not. It, there's a lot of moral ambiguity. There's a lot of gray area that fairy tales explore, which, again, is, I think, one reason of their enduring quality for adults and for children, because whether you're a child or whether you're an adult, you're faced with these morally gray dilemmas on maybe not a daily basis, but certainly navigating life is that way. I agree. Um, Megan asked, what kind of fairy tales do you suggest for teens? So maybe this is where you can put a push in for Bluebeard. <laughs> well, yeah, Blue, Bluebeard's one of my favorite stories, and it's not because I think it's great that Bluebeard's killing his wives. Um, that's I'm, I'm not in favor of that by any stretch, but I can talk about my favorite fairy tales later. Um, fairy tales for teens. That's an interesting, you know, um, Neil Gaiman is a really great writer, and off the top of my head, I can't think of the name of his books, but he's written a lot of uh, young adult books for teens. I think Stardust, I can't remember the name, but Neil Gaiman is a wonderful British writer who has written almost everything he writes has something to do with fairy tales or fantasy um, that are really fantastic. So that would be a good author, Neil Gaiman. Like he's the one that did, uh, he did Coraline. Yes, he did Coraline. Yeah, yes. I knew I couldn't remember it either. Okay, so but, and, and that's a little bit younger than teens, right? I mean, my my ten year old daughter reads reads Coraline, but yeah, but Neil Gaiman's fantastic. Well, I think a uh, definitely a teenager <clears throat> could handle Bluebeard, and <clears throat> you know some of those more violent fairy tales. So Ryan, um, also oh, right. really you know what? One other one other author comes to mind. Sorry, I'm 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 thinking off. I, I'm still thinking of that question. Um, Emma Donahue is another um, British or Scottish, I can't remember. Emma Donahue has some books, uh, short story collections. Again, I can't think of the names of them off the top of my head, but in terms of writers who write sort of modernized fairy tales, like adaptations, retellings in different contexts, um, Emma Donahue is another really good, uh, really good author. It's not surprising, you know, the British are really great with um, reimagining and reconstructing fairy tales. Well, you know what, and I have to tell you, I read the Grimm's fairy tale. I had a Grimm's book. I read those fairy tales through college. I was reading those. I just absolutely loved all of them. Um, another author, I think, who has his books have all the trappings of a fairy tale uh, is Rule Dahl. I mean, James yes. of the Giant Peach, in the first paragraph, yeah. his parents get, what, eaten or killed by a wild rhinoceros. Right. And you have the twits, and you have the all the things that are going wrong with Matilda. So I love Rural Doll, and I think sometimes parents have said that they think that they're a little violent, but I think if you think of it as a fairy tale, it just changes your perspective. Yeah, he's great for um, 
I mean, yeah, I, I still, I think I was still reading Raw Dahl even when I was a, when I was a teenager, um, but he's definitely great for like ages between, you know, eight years old and 10, 12 years old. He's fantastic for those ages. Absolutely. Well, this is another one. This is Strudelpater, and this is actually a book that my German grandmother had, and I think teenagers would <laughs> enjoy this one. Um, this was written by Hans Hoffmann. He was German, and he had eight children, and around Christmas time, he wanted to buy them presents. He didn't have any money, so he wrote these morbid little tales. Uh, this is Strudelpater. You know, you see his bushy hair and his big, long fingernails. He refused to cut his hair and his fingernails, and so this uh, guy comes in, chops his fingernails off, but as he's chopping the fingernails off, he chops off his fingers. So you see in the pictures, you know, the blood is dripping down, and another one, a little boy refuses to eat, and um, they keep trying and trying and trying to get him to eat his soup, and he doesn't, and he gets skinnier and skinnier, and eventually he dies, and then on top of his uh, tombstone, they have a bowl of soup. I mean, they're very typical of what you were talking about, German <laughs> violence that, you know, the Germans uh, love. Yeah, I mean, German fairy tales, you know, because again, like you have to understand that the fairy tales are produced within particular cultures and fairy tales reflect, as I was saying before, those, those cultural nuances. Um, and obviously I'm generalizing a little, you know, I'm not saying that all Germans are violent, right? But, you know, German culture, if you've ever been there or, or you know, no, you know, it's very rigid, very orderly, very precise, very machine like. Right. I mean, there, there's a sense of order and authoritarianism. Right. And, you know, I mean, along those lines, it's very interesting that, you know, um, after World War Two, fairy tales got an incredibly bad rap because of the ways that the Nazis appropriated fairy tales. You know, the Nazis, through their propaganda media wing, were producing very propagandistic uh, fairy tales that were encouraging and really used to justify uh, the Holocaust. So in the aftermath of World War II, it's very interesting to note that historically, in both East and West Germany, fairy tales were banned uh, for about a decade. Uh, they, you, couldn't, you couldn't own a fairy tale book. You couldn't buy a fairy tale book. You'd get uh, prison sentences for fairy tale books. You know, it was a very rigidly coming down um, on fairy tales because of the extent to which Nazism used fairy tales as a justification and propaganda to enforce the terrible, awful things that they did during the war. Yeah, and that's why it's interesting to me, uh, Bruno Bettelheim, who was a child psychologist and he was Jewish and he went through the Holocaust. And when he came out, he wrote this book, The Uses of Enchantment, which has been used for years and years by you know people yeah. like myself, just wanting to read and to understand fairy tales. So I think it's amazing that he wrote this book having been, you know, a victim of the Holocaust and yet understanding the importance of reading fairy tales to kids. And I mean, you know, fairy tales have always been used politically too. I mean, it's one of the things that I study as a scholar. I, I'm very interested in the political uses of fairy tales. So, I mean, every culture has used fairy tales in some ways, clearly not to the extent that the Nazis did, but every culture has used and appropriated, you know, fairy tales are they're very malleable. As I said before, you know, they're constantly changing the images, the motifs can always be rearranged to, to suit a certain preference or a point of view. So, you know, there, there's, there's a kind of enchanting thing to the form of fairy tales and they're, you know, just as there's magic in fairy tales and beauty, there's absolute horror and there's nightmare and there's really awful things happening in fairy tales. Um, but, you know, to sort of wrap back around to what we were saying before, despite those awful things, there is always this projection of a utopia, a, a happily ever after of some kind, that there, there's a hope that even in the bleakest sense, we can find a way through this path. Not all fairy tales, you know, some of them end pretty morbidly and terribly. Um, but for the most part, there's this sense that we can find our way through horror. And, and I love that about, my myself, I love that about fairy tales because to me it's saying both to the hero or the heroine or both, if you have courage and if you persist, you can overcome any obstacle and you can conquer any foe. And best of all, you can reach your heart's desires. And also Amy men mentioned Roald Dahl's BFG, which is also another fabulous one. Let me show you a couple of books that, um, that I had as a child. This one, uh, it was out of print for a while. It's now back into print again. Uh, it's just the golden book of Little Fairy Tales. But the thing that I love about this, 
I love the illustrations. The illustrations are gorgeous. If you go into my resource section on my website, Good Parenting Brighter Children, the resource section is at the top. You can click, and I've listed a bunch of my very favorite fairy tales, fairy tale books. I like to look at the illustrators. Um, this is one of Snow White, uh, Trisha uh, Hyman. She's done a number of different um, ones that she uh, illustrated. There's um, Hegarty Peg actually is considered a fairy tale too. Oops, so. And this is a wonderful book about a mother with her seven children and she how she saves them from the wicked Hegarty Peg. You know, there's always uh, some wicked witch or some wicked person. And in this one, the mother is the one that saves her children. Um, <clears throat> This is the one, this is the uh, Cinderella that I was telling you about. I found this in a used bookstore. Don't discount used bookstores. They have treasure troves of wonderful books and, you know, that will bring a lot of incredible memories back to your mind of when you were a child in different fairy tales. And then the last one, Ryan will appreciate this one. This is classic fairy tales. This is uh, Scott Gustavuson doing the... Um, the illustrations on this. I love this one. He does really, really large prints. And over the years, I purchased four prints uh, of his uh, illustrated fairy tales. They're gorgeous. I have them uh, matted and framed. They hang in my home. And um, I guess all my kids will fight over which one, they're, uh, which one they want. So Ryan, thank you. This has been extremely informative. We really appreciate it. Is there anything that, um, that you would like to end by saying maybe your favorite fairy tale or some last tidbit uh, words of advice to parents? Oh, gosh, probably not. I mean, I probably said too much already. Um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, there, there's something wonderfully magic about fairy tales, even into your adulthood. I think that's one of the things that I appreciate so much about my upbringing is that I was able to enjoy these fairy tales. And now as an adult, one of the real great pleasures is being able to share them with my kids. It's kind of like the same thing with Christmas, right? You lose a sense of enchantment between learning things about, you know, Christmas and Santa Claus through your teen years and you sort of get disenchanted. But then when you have kids, the enchantment comes back all over again because now you get to play the role of Santa and now you get to help proliferate this sense of enchantment. And I think it's the same thing with fairy tales. Um, I get to share these with my kids now and it's wonderful to see them gravitating towards these, these notions of enchantment and magic and struggle and, and triumph. And it becomes a legacy. It, that will be something that they will remember forever and they will pass that down to their children. So thank you, Ryan, and thank you, everyone, for your questions and for tuning in. Appreciate the time. Hope this has been beneficial to you. Um, again, uh, the, this is, has been recorded, and I will be posting it on all of my different Facebook pages as well as my YouTube channel. And again, if you want to um, read anything about uh, the importance of fairy tales on my blog, um, you can. I think I published it towards the end of May. Thank you again. Uh, we appreciate your time. Talk to you soon.